it's hard to be contemplative and be a timekeeper. That's something I've learned in a number of years leading worship. That's why I might be looking a little fidgety between readings during this minute of silence that I'm holding, because I'm also wanting to hold silence. In this chapter from John today, we have a lot that we could unpack, but I'm not going to do that. That was 41 verses. If you've got questions about any of them, email me. Instead, I want us to think about what's going on in the text, how God moves in the text, what's going on today, and how God is moving today as we see God moving through the text. In this text, we have a man who is born blind. Being born blind in the first century, particularly in the Near East religions that we observe, was indicative of some kind of divine punishment. The disciples ask Jesus, who is being punished? Or who was sinning, this man or his parents? Jesus said, no one. This man is blind so that God can be glorified, so that God can act through me. Jesus makes dirt. He puts it on the man's eyes, sends him to wash into a pool. And the man is sighted. He can see. This is not the first time that Jesus has healed on the Sabbath, uh, not even in John's gospel. And so that doesn't make the local religious leaders very happy. One of the reasons I used the Common English Bible today is that what is sometimes translated as the Jews, or other times the Judeans, uh, is, in the Common English Bible, the Jewish leaders. These are synagogue and temple authorities who don't like their religious authority being challenged, and certainly don't want their comfort with the empire being challenged. This is a reality when this man, our blind man, names for the first time, or rather not for the first time, Jesus as a prophet. Those were words that scared the religious leaders. So they ask around. They want to make sure that this man was born blind and he's healed. They ask him. They don't believe him. They ask his parents, and they say, we're not getting into this. He's old enough. Ask him. They ask him again. He's tired of them. And so he gets a little sassy and says, why? Do you want to be his disciples? Then they claim what they know, claim the eternal covenants they have, saying, we believe in Moses, and we don't know where this man comes from. The man goes to find Jesus again. Jesus says, it was me. Now you can see me. And the man professes his faith in Jesus as the Messiah, as a prophet. There are a lot of ways that God is acting in this text. As we heard last week about the Samaritan woman at the well, a woman, the wrong kind of person, is used to get her whole village to believe in Jesus. That was the end of the passage last week. They all come back believing in Jesus, and he stays with them for two days teaching. This week, we have a man born blind, someone who theoretically has been born in sin, is being punished. He proclaims Jesus as the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world, not only to the religious leaders who don't want to hear it, but to his family and to anyone who will hear it. We can tell that this passage was written, as was all of John, much later than the synoptic Gospels. Because when this man's parents don't want to answer it because they fear being thrown out of the synagogues, that didn't happen while Jesus was alive. This is a passage for us today. Not because we've been thrown out of our religious communities for professing Jesus, but because we are a community in isolation right now, trying to keep the faith. A retired priest friend of mine feels like a lot of John gets misused only for reading and for teaching, and not for devotional material. John's gospel was written later, uh, was written later for a community of Jesus Jews 
who had been thrown out of their synagogues, who had lost all access to their families, if their families didn't join them, who had lost access to income, because if you were outside of the synagogue in a Jewish community, you were essentially outside of life. So this gospel is written so that they, these believers in exile, would keep believing, keep having faith, and to remember that God worked through Jesus and is still working through Jesus to redeem the whole of creation. We have in this passage the wrong kind of person, born on the outside, healed, showing that God doesn't favor people who do things right, and then used to tell his family, look at the goodness that I have found. You all know that we are in isolation right now. Uh, Many of us who are school-aged are staying home from school. Many of us who are not school-aged are staying home from school with those who are. Or if we are working in a non-essential job, we're not working at a grocery store, we're staying home. Many of us have moved our work online. We're starting to feel after a week, a week and a half, maybe two of buckled down self-containment and social distancing alone, without one another. Reading John's Gospel today, written to early Jesus followers who felt alone and without one another, we can remember that God is still here. God is still working. The Johannine Church, the church in the school of John, used this gospel to bolster their faith. It was good news for them. We've got good news ourselves. We're using new technologies. We're streaming worship today. We're going to try something different next week so that it's not just me talking at a webcam. We're praying the daily office together. We're averaging five people between morning and evening prayer every day this week. We're staying connected to one another and to God in ways that we can. Sharon and Susie have already proposed ideas to stay collected in our Facebook group, ways to stay in touch and hear each other's voices. Today, I invite you to join for coffee hour, which may or may not include some faith formation. We'll see how you feel uh, at 10.30. This Wednesday at 12 noon, I'm starting to offer a lunch break. I'm doing these things for the same reason that the school of John wrote John's gospel. That we may believe and know that we are not alone, even as our economic systems might be impacted negatively because of our inability to work. We are not alone because we know one another. We love one another and we are a community of Jesus believers. We are not alone because the church exists, not primarily to bring people together for the sake of being together, though it is a byproduct, but to bring us together so that our lives are changed through encounters with Jesus. Today, we have the story of a man who doesn't even know what Jesus looks like and whose life is changed through his encounter. As we go through this time, however long it may be, grieving, necessary changes to our routines. Remember that we have one another and that even without Christ present in bread and wine, Christ is present, Christ is here, changing us as his church gathered, as we encounter him. Amen.